and welcome to uh, Passport to 2044, our legislative session focusing, legislative session wrap up focusing on comprehensive planning and the 20, uh, 2023 legislative session. Uh, my name is Liz Underwood Boltman. I'm a principal planner with the growth management team at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, and we've got a really great turnout today. We really appreciate um, all of you attending here and joining us. Uh, we have been doing uh, this particular series with uh, Department of Commerce and offering um, a number of different webinars over the course of the last year addressing different topics related to the comprehensive plan. Uh, we've been doing a lot of outreach with local governments and hearing a lot of questions about uh, the legislative session and kind of where things are at and what and how that might influence your local plan updates. So um, we are excited to uh, share this webinar with you today and hopefully address some of the questions that you may have. Um, so we've had a series of about 12, this is our 12th webinar today, um, but we have uh, a lot of uh, topics that we've uh, covered in the past. Uh, we've got recordings and materials from all of our past events um, on our website. Um, and we have another session that we um, anticipate kind of later this summer addressing a racial equity impact assessment tool. So a number of different topics, though, if you want to go back and look at um, some of the resources we provided for the plan updates. Um, and just a plug that I know the Department of Commerce um, is starting their webinar series for the 2025 updates. So there may be a few other topics that um, they'll cover um, that could be still relevant to folks who are working in the Central Puget Sound as well. Um, so in terms of our program today, um, I'm going to be joined by um, other staff from the Puget Sound Regional Council, um, as well as staff from Department of Commerce. So Robin Kosky, um, the Director of um, Government Relations at PSRC, is going to give kind of a high-level overview of the legislative session, including things from the budget and some of the bills and kind of where they stand. Um, and I'm going to we're going to touch up on a few bills in particular, focusing on um, middle housing, accessory dwelling units, as well as climate change and the growth management. Act. Um, and we'll also get an overview from the Department of Commerce about um, other bills that, that uh, passed related to gro the Growth Management Act, as well as um, other things that the, that the Department of the Commerce is doing to help implement um, the bills that passed. So we got a lot of great questions that came in as part of the registration. So we're going to try to touch on a few of those today. But um, I, we're definitely not going to be able to touch on everything. A lot, of, a lot happened this legislative session, so uh, we'll definitely do the best we can to cover things that you're interested in, but um, may not get into absolutely everything. Um, I also noted from the um, from registration, we've got a lot of folks attending from Central Puget Sound, but as well from other parts of the state. So um, I think we've got a little bit of a bent in terms of um, providing information most relevant to the 2024 uh, jurisdictions, but hopefully content is relevant to absolutely everyone. So um, that's the goal here. Um, and I'd also just flag that, you know, I think the legislative session wrapped up, but we're still kind of understanding all the bills that passed. And it takes a while to sort of like unpack and understand kind of like how, what all the implications are. So we're going to present about the information that we know today and just do the best that we can. But uh, there may be still questions kind of as these bills are implemented and as more guidance comes out. So um, but we'll do the best we can to cover what we can today. Um, so we will record this particular session and we will sh uh, we usually post that within a few days on our website. Um, we also will share um, the presentations on our website as well. Um, if you have a question during the session, please feel free to pop that in the Q&A box. Um, we will uh, kind of go through questions towards the end of the session um, and try to cover as many as we can. Um, and if we can't answer everything, we may be able to follow up at a future point in terms of trying to kind of unpack some of the questions that folks have. Um, we do have a survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar where well, that pops up that help, helps us um, address our Title VI requirements. So we would love if you'd be able to fill that out. Um, and for folks who are AICP planners, uh, we do um, have a credit that we can offer for um, an AICP law credit for the live event today. Um, so the ID number is there. You can also just search um, for the session on the AICP webpage. But uh, we're excited to be able to offer that uh, on this uh, a rare legal credit. So um, we thought that would be helpful for us today. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, pass it over to Robin Kosky, who is going to give an update about the legislative session. Robin. Just waiting to share my screen. There we go. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Um, and um, just let me know if my screen is wonky, but it should be up there. Robin, it is looking a little wonky. There we go. OK, I think I got it now. Yep. <laughs> um, Hi, everyone. As Liz said, I'm Robin Kosky, the Director of Government Relations and Communications here at PSRC. And I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of what happened on housing permitting some of the Growth Management Act bills this session. And my colleagues are going to go into deeper detail on some of the bills. And then the Department of Commerce will be going, um, giving a little bit of additional in information about some of the implementation work that they're going to be doing with local governments. So um, the legislature did pass three budgets this year, the operating budget, capital budget, and transportation budget. Um, but the house, housing and eliminating barriers to creating housing was definitely a big focus for the legislature. And while not all of the housing bills passed, they did deliver quite a lot following the three pillars of PSRC's regional housing strategy of subsidy, supply, and stability. Um, and, you know, I think you can always take a mark of where focus is of a legislative body by where they put a significant amount of funding. Certainly housing did see quite a bit. Just wanted to go over a little bit of what's in the capital budget, um, $400 million for the Housing Trust Fund to, to develop affordable homes across the state, $60 million for the Connecting Housing to Infrastructure Program to provide uh, local governments with grants for public utility connections, $40 million for a new land acquisition program at the Washington State Housing Finance Commission, $25 million for transit-oriented development, which will also be matched with $25 million from Amazon for a public-private partnership, and then a significant amount for weatherization and home upgrade programs at $124 million. And just moving on to the operating budget, uh, there was $150 million in the budget to implement House Bill 1474, creating the Covenant Investment Act to provide home ownership opportunities for people harmed by racist real estate practices, and then $38 million for permanent supportive housing through the Apple uh, Health and Homes Program. Uh, there was also uh, some funding uh, in to assist local governments, and uh, I suspect Dave Anderson from the Washington State Department of Commerce will go in a little bit a little bit more detail in how the Department of Commerce plans to roll out this funding for local governments. But there was two point three million dollars associated with implementing the Middle Housing Bill, forty point nine million for local governments implementing the Climate Change Planning Bill, uh, House Bill eleven eighty one, and then. And, um, three and a half million dollars for local permit review, and then another bucket of six million dollars uh, of planning for housing supply that I think included middle housing, TOD, and permitting. Um, so some some significant funding in the budget. I think you know obviously everyone knows that there were a lot of changes uh, for local governments to digest this legislative session and and changes for them to make. But they did recognize that some funding would be needed to help implement these changes. So that's very good news. I just wanted to go into a little bit of kind of the, the budget bills that pass or the housing bills that passed and didn't pass and GMA bills. So first, um, onto the things that pass. House Bill 1110, the Middle Housing Bill, 1337, the Accessory Dwelling Unit Bill. Um, Paul is going to go into some more detail about these bills and their impacts for comprehensive planning. And then I just wanted to mention Senate Bill 5258 that did make some small changes uh, on condos and townhouses. Um, you know, we do hear a lot about how it's hard to construct condos, how hard to construct middle housing, so some efforts there. And then I already mentioned in the budget um, that there was uh, $150 million to implement the Covenant Home Ownership Act. That's really great um, effort to invest in BIPOC home ownership. And um, that comes from an additional $100 increase in the document recording fees that has been the source of homelessness funding for our state for many years now. And then finally on this slide, we have uh, the climate change, the GMA climate bill um, that will require climate planning and comprehensive plans. That's House Bill 1181. And Liz is going to talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. Um, three, a suite of three bills passed on permitting. Uh, you can see them on the screen, um, but certainly some, some significant changes there with some implementation funding for the local permit processes bill by Senator Mullet, uh, House Bill 5290. 
now we're going to move over to the things that didn't pass. <laughs> Um, of course, which you may be feeling glad about because so many things already did pass. Um, but um, the uh, transit oriented development bill, Senate Bill 5466 by Senator Leas, um, moved very quickly through the Senate with bipartisan votes, um, then got over to the House. And, um, you know, I think some impacts were realized. PSRC did do some significant work on mapping what the transit buffers would have looked at looked like and how far out from the transit areas and the transit stations the development changes would have occurred. Um, and um, that bill was not successful in passing them. It was a pretty big bill, um, and it was really the first time it had been introduced in the form that it was in. Um, so, you know, not a huge surprise that it didn't make it over the finish line. Same thing with the um, Representative Barkas's bill, the, the one that stayed alive was House Bill 1245 on lot splitting. We did get some questions about whether, you know, we were thinking that these bills would be introduced next year. I do I do, of course, you can never tell for sure what will happen um, from one year to the next, but I do think that there may be some interest um, on behalf of legislators about reintroducing both of these bills. Um, and PSRC will certainly be working over the interim with legislators to, um, you know, and, and local governments. Um, we've already been fielding a, a number of calls from, from people um, for some more information, and um, we're happy to sort of stay part of the conversation and help people understand what you know different policies what the impacts might be on the ground um and then uh, the last bill on this slide is house bill 1628 that would have increased the real estate excise tax on high-end properties um, that bill uh, was a very much a part of the discussion in Olympia this year, but neither the House nor the Senate chose to use it as a method to fund housing in their budgets, uh, so that bill also did not make it. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention, um, we were watching three housing stability uh, bills limiting rent increases. None of those bills uh, passed. There were you know, three pretty different approaches for how you might address um, limiting rent increases in our states. Um, you know, I do think that this is gonna be a continuing topic of conversation. Of course, can't predict which one of these or a different uh, proposal that might come up next year, but I suspect that um, you know, the cost of rents is gonna be something that we continue to grapple with in Washington state. So that was all that I had. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Paul Ingram, who is gonna talk about the middle housing bill and the accessory dwelling unit bill. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Let me get my screen pulled up here. All right, I think we're doing okay there. Um, so I'm Paul Ingram. I'm the Director of Growth Management at Puget Sound Regional Council. Glad to be with you this afternoon. Uh, appreciate Robin giving that overview. It's certainly one of the takeaways from the session was that a, a lot of different things happened, um, a number of different changes. I'm going to focus in. There we go. Uh, I'm going to focus in on 1110 and 1337 while acknowledging that there are a few other bills that are also somewhat tangential or related. Um, that also um, relate to housing and how we're doing comprehensive planning in our cities. Um, I think perhaps one of the, the main takeaways is that these bills work for more of this middle housing or moderate housing, um, uh, housing opportunities across the region and within our cities. Um, but there's also, there's some CEPA reform, um, Robin mentioned one of the bills, um, 5412, that talks about some of the SEPA and there's SEPA exemptions within these bills. So there's also those changes. Uh, Robin mentioned 5466 didn't pass, but I'll note that many of our communities in the Puget Sound region already are doing uh, stationary planning, rezoning uh, around stations, um, taking that into account. So that is very active, even though that bill didn't pass and may or may not come back. Um, and then a lot of cities are working currently through their comprehensive plan updates with addressing House Bill 1220 from the 2021 legislative session. And in many ways, that's going to have um, perhaps a bigger impact on your comprehensive planning process today than some of these more recent changes, although they, they all have an interrelationship. So uh, to some extent in this kind of short presentation here, try to talk about how these things interrelate 
as much as kind of just drilling down on each individual bill because as cities are looking at this, they really have to try to pull these things together. They're, I don't know that you can just implement one bill at a time. Um, so uh, looking at the two bills overlapping, uh, somewhat we're looking at uh, 1337 requires two ADUs. That means every lot would be required to allow three units and in some cases more. As I mentioned, a number of limitations on SEPA and SEPA appeals or other types of appeals, um, limits on parking requirements when near transit. Um, it also expands some of this involvement as to how commerce will review some of these uh, uh, changes, changes to the development reg regulations. Um, and then of course, PSRC has a review and certification process for local comprehensive plans. So um, overlap between the two bills, um, diving just into the 1110 specifically. Um, so I think many of you are probably aware it's called the middle housing bill. It allows for many cities um, two to six units per lot. And we'll look at a chart as to which cities that applies to. There's a hierarchy there. Um, in most single family zoning districts uh, amongst those affected cities must be adopted six months after the comp plan deadline for our Puget Sound city. So on June 30th, 2025, I think that kind of the caution there is if you're finishing your comprehensive plan update in December of 24, by that deadline, six months is a really short time period to then turn and focus just on meeting these, these two bills. And they both have this deadline. Um, so wanting to encourage cities and counties to take into account these bills during their comprehensive plan update process now and setting that groundwork and potentially even getting some early work done towards meeting that, that deadline. Um, uh, something new and different under GMA is that Commerce is assigned to develop a model ordinance and that model ordinance would take effect if cities fail to act under the legislation. Um, there's a provision where it can apply to 75% of the single family area. So in the bill has some specifics about where that should or should not apply to um, based upon areas of displacement or critical areas and so on. So that is something that cities can look at of having a it restricted to 75% rather than the entire single family area, but there's um, some work that would have to be done to document which areas that applies to. So here's the chart, uh, larger cities, four units per lot, six units if near transit or if it includes affordability, um, cities between 25,000 and 75,000, two units per lot or four units uh, in, each, in the transit and affordability options. Cities less than 25,000, two units if they're within that contiguous UTA. So in our kind of metropolitan urban area, many of those smaller cities are fit within that contiguous UTA. Um, outlying cities um, that are more standalone, um, they, it, this may not apply to them, but the ADU bill still will. One of the really interesting provisions of the law is that it allows or it requires cities to allow for lot splitting within this case. So the lot split bill didn't pass, but this one does have a provision that allows for that short subdivision to match. Um, this is one where the, the, there's just a short section in the bill that applies to this. And so how cities work on this, how they align it up with their subdivision regulations could be a lot of work. Um, but people also talk a lot about creating ownership opportunities and the ability to create um, let land segregation subdivision here to support these different types of units could be a really powerful tool to encourage ownership. So that's, I, I think, a lot more work to happen, and we'll see how this plays out. Could be very interesting. Um, talking a little bit now about 1337, similar in some ways. Um, allows two um, accessory dwelling units, it requires cities to allow for detached dwelling units, um, and applies to cities and counties in the urban area. So it applies to a broader geographic area than 1110 does, um, has the same deadline six months after the periodic deadline, so by June 30th for Puget Sound area cities. Um, it's worth noting that that section five in the bill was vetoed. Um, a number of different provisions. I won't go through all these. Um, I mentioned detached units. 
Um, it also has limitations on requiring street improvements or capping impact fees. So um, things to, to definitely watch there. Specific then to the ADUs, that might be different from how other middle housing or the 1110 provisions apply. Um, some of the similarities. So we're looking at three units per lot as kind of a minimum within the urban area. Um, even if 1110 only says duplexes, um, limits on SEPA, as we mentioned, uh, covenants are still going to be an issue in many communities. We we're talking with one city that has a lot of more, um, more recent subdivision development, master plan developments. They anticipated that you know, a majority of their single family zoning was probably constrained by covenants. So the, um, how it affects city, each city will be different depending on the type of development that's been built in the past. Um, the, the ADUs and the middle housing provisions will help cities address those requirements in 1220. And we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in a second, but they may not address uh, some of the harder parts about affordability. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, they also allow for some limitations. Um, there's recognition that some areas may not have sewer or water or have other constraints, critical areas, and so on. So some people have raised issues about like, well, what if we don't have water capacity? Well, there's provisions in each of the bill that address that there, there could be limitations on allowing either of these forms of housing if there are those types of uh, constraints and restrictions. Um, 1110 specifically calls for like doing some more work to analyze what are those constraints and whether they can be resolved. Um, a question that we've heard come up is, does this resolve my capacity issues? Say that a jurisdiction has a new target. They're wondering how do they um, upzone or rezone areas to be able to create the capacity to be able to meet that target. Well, now that 1110 and 1337 have passed, does that automatically kind of create that new capacity that might address the, the target need that they have for their community or their housing needs? It might. It might uh, do a bunch of work towards that. Um, but a word of caution and what we often like to uh, talk to people about is showing the work. How does it work out? So example that that city where covenants might restrict a lot of this development well, that should be taken into account. Are there critical areas or infrastructure constraints that would prevent some of this from occurring? Is the housing stock really new and recent and unlikely to get redeveloped? That should be taken into account. So be, be careful. We wouldn't want to see a city just take all their single family zoning, multiply it by four and say, hey, now we have all this new capacity. It really, we should look at the context and the situation of what's out there and try to estimate that capacity as best we can. And then as I was saying, also important to note that middle housing might be a really good form of housing for at the moderate income level, unless it's by an affordable housing provider, probably not addressing that 30% of median income uh, household level, that, that very lower um, end of the affordability spectrum. So um, it could be a really good strategy and tool for your community might help you address uh, some of those 1220 um, housing requirements, but it's probably not addressing the very low income aspects. So a few quick scenarios, rural area, neither bill applies. Unincorporated urban area, the ADU bill applies, but not the middle housing bill. Um, in a city less than 25,000, um, they both apply if they're within that contiguous UGA. And then in cities over 25,000, um, there's that's where there's a lot of overlap between the two bills. And there's some individual requirements between the two bills, and there's some ways in which they can um, overlap and count together. Um, some people have asked us like, okay, so what do we need to do? Kind of what are the simple steps? And um, this is the way that I would try to um, frame kind of the basic elements. So the first part would be, Regardless of these bills, there's the GMA requirement of looking at your growth target and your housing capacity under the zoning. So just kind of doing that basic check. Do you have enough zoning capacity overall to meet your growth needs? Um, 
And number three here is kind of the new part under House Bill 1220. So again, not so much affected by these new legislation, but what's required under 1220 of looking at that housing need by those different income bands. And does your zoning allow for that housing to be built? I often ask people like, if the housing authority wanted to build some housing in your community, if the funding was there and it could, somebody wanted to do it, could it be done? So that's really kind of the question there. And then as you get down those steps and looking at like, what are the local strategies? Are you addressing barriers? And that's where um, 1110, 1337 and, and the SEPA bills um, may be useful in talking about these are some of the different tools and strategies that a community is using to try to satisfy um, housing at each of the different income bands. So that's mine. Hopefully I didn't go too long. Liz, you're next to talk about 1181. Great, thank you. Share my screen. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about House Bill 1181 um, and uh, climate change in the Growth Management Act. So um, uh, the kind of high level uh, takeaway from H uh, from HB uh, 1181 is that it adds a required uh, climate change and resilience element to the comp plans. And uh, it updates the Growth Management Act goals. Uh, it also incorporates um, climate change into other elements within the comprehensive plan, like the land use element, utilities element, and transportation. Um, and commerce, uh, uh, I think hopefully Dave can touch a little bit on some of the work that the commerce is doing on guidance, but um, commerce was directed to develop guidance as part and a model element as part of uh, this bill. Um, fortunately, the legislature previously funded some of that work, so there um, is existing work that commerce has already developed in order to help support this work uh, in the, the next cycle of plan updates. Uh, in the context of the Central Puget Sound, um, the bill... Uh, uh, would really comes into effect uh, for jurisdictions by their by the 2029 implementation progress report. So it was passed a little bit too late to directly affect the 2024 comprehensive plan update, um, but will require um, an updated climate element as well as an updated transportation element um, by 2029 for those jurisdictions with more than 6,000 residents. Um, and so the, those jurisdictions with 6, 000, more than 6,000 re residents um, are required to do an emission reduction sub-element. Um, so that's about 65 of our cities as well as the counties. Um, well, it's also encouraged for another 21 of our jurisdictions. Um, all of our jurisdictions get to do a resilient sub-element though um, to address um, the requirements as part of the bill. Um, I think some of the context here is that Vision 2050 and the multi-county planning policies already address climate. So um, we've already done a significant amount of work as part of the multi-county planning policies, as well as the countywide plan planning policies um, to address climate. So part of that work um, is really a part of our existing set of policies, and we would expect to be included as part of the 24 updates. Um, so really, some of the difference here is that House Bill 1181 adds specificity. It also addresses the more specific requirements and other elements, um, and it requires a standalone element. So I um, just wanted to talk a little bit um, for Central Puget Sound jurisdictions about um, things that we're looking for as part of the 2024 Comprehensive Plan update. So we have a consistency tool um, that talks about the things that we look for um, as part of our review of local plans. Um, and that review includes a number of uh, policies related to um, achieving emission reduction goals by looking th at things like electrification, uh, building energy, reducing uh, vehicle miles traveled, um, as well as addressing resilience um, by addressing things like carbon sequestration, uh, impacts to vulnerable communities, um, impacts just general other types of impacts to climate change. Um, and we also, uh, as part of our transportation requirements, look at providing multimodal uh, transportation options. So these are things that we're looking for as part of the 2024 comprehensive plan updates, um, sort of regardless of HB 1181. Um, so as part of the bill, um, the, the requirements around a greenhouse gas emission sub-element would include um, actions to reduce emissions as well as vehicle miles traveled, um, and then also prioritizing reductions that help benefit uh, overburdened communities. 
Uh, the resiliency element looks at policies and programs to enhance natural areas, address natural, natural hazards um, associated with climate change. So a couple of different distinct um, approaches with that, um, but uh, in terms of the requirements. Um, the bill also directs commerce to develop guidance as well as a model element, which I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, commerce has already developed um, some of that work that was released for public uh, comment back in the spring. Um, the bill also provides for an optional approval process that, from commerce that would help in terms of um, appeals to the hearings board. The bill also um, includes a number of updates to the Growth Management Act goals. Um, so as part of this work, um, as for your 2024 comprehensive plan updates, it's really it's it's really still important to look at the updated goals. Um, so an updated transportation goal to address um, reduced emissions um, as well as VMT, um, a new goal related to climate, um, as well as updates to the citizen participation, open space, and environment goals. Um, so these are still goals that you should definitely consult as part of your 2024 updates um, and your uh, additional work related to the GMA before 2029. Um, the bill also includes some updated definitions, so it's really worth kind of consulting the bill in terms of new definitions around uh, transportation system, active transportation, uh, uh, environmental justice, um, other new terms uh, in, in GMA. Uh, I wanted to highlight in particular some of the changes related to the transportation element. Um, so really worth a dive through this particular bill to understand kind of what those changes will be for the for the transportation elements due by 2029. Um, so the bill uh, requires if you have an ADA transition plan to incorporate that as part of the transportation element. Um, provides a little more specificity about a complete inventory of active transportation facilities. Uh, it also, as I mentioned, there's some new definitions. One of the new definitions is around active transportation, which really now specifies that active transportation uh, must consider um, accommodations uh, related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I think makes um, ADA and the relationship with ADA and transportation elements more clear. Um, and I think in our review of uh, transportation elements in the past that hasn't always been clear. So um, I think maybe an important change that while due by 2029 is something work that can happen earlier than that as part of the 24 updates. Um, the bill also requires new multimodal level of service standards. So addressing level of service for um, active transportation, transit, um, as well as vehicles. Um, addresses things like incorporating um, state facilities and understanding of um, financing for state facilities as part of the reassessment strategy. Um, it also requires updates to concurrency um, to address multimodal or demand management options. So a number of different changes that I, I think are well worth a read um, and think considering how they, you could potentially incorporate them earlier, but also as part of your um, element to do later. Um, there are also additional updates to other elements uh, like land use, capital facilities, utilities, um, and parks and rec. So um, uh, as part of this work, because there are changes to the transportation element, um, we anticipate that PSRC would uh, proceed with certifying uh, elements again after the 29 updates. So um, I mentioned we've got a lot of existing resources available. So um, Commerce, if you visit their uh, website, uh, they have their draft guidance available from the climate element. I know they're doing some work to help address uh, the new requirements part of um, 1181. Um, but I think that's a really good starting point to, to consult if you're um, pursuing this work earlier um, and will, will be really important guidance as part of this work. Uh, we also have some existing resources available on PSRC's planning resources page. So uh, we prepared guidance um, around climate change and resilience. Um, I think we'll probably take a look and try to see if there are, it needs any updates after this. But um, I think it's a good baseline to understand some of the requirements as part of Vision 2050 and the 2024 updates. Um, and there are a bunch of other resources like um, the emissions inventories that were done for each of the four counties, um, as well as other resources from UW. So lots of information out there about climate uh, and planning. Uh, we also have a guidance related to transportation that provides some examples of multimodal level of service and concurrency updates uh, that were completed as part of um, other plan updates as well. Um, I'm going to pass it to Dave here in a second, but just mentioning there were a couple other bills of interest um, that um, I think Robin didn't, didn't touch on, but 
uh, looking at uh, House Bill 1425, which restores the sales use uh, tax incentive to encourage annexation. Um, also 5452, uh, which also clarifies the use of impact fees for bike and ped facilities, which I think will be a helpful part of um, implementing some of the new requirements in 1181. So a couple of bills of interest for us uh, in terms of encouraging um, annexation, as well as uh, encouraging uh, active transportation options. So I think that's it. Um, happy to answer questions when we get to Q&A, but um, I think I will take the chance to pass it to Dave Anderson from Department of Commerce, um, who will talk a little bit more about um, Commerce's summary of the bills. All right, good afternoon, folks. After all that talk about the climate change and the housing bills, I'm sure you're wondering, how could there possibly be anything else? Um, there were actually a few other bills that I think uh, you may find interesting, um, especially if you're a smaller jurisdiction or if you're in some of the more rural parts of the state. So I'm gonna talk about some of the other bills that came out of the collaborative roadmap process uh, and some other things you might wanna know about. And then I'm gonna talk about sort of where we move forward uh, where commerce is going to have some tools available for you to help you with the implementation of uh, all of these bills and talk a little bit more about uh, implementation timelines and what's, uh, what's coming up for our grant program. So I alluded to the collaborative roadmap process. This was the third, um, this was the third phase of the collaborative roadmap process and resulted in a number of bills that sort of had recommendations in the past. We actually got all the way through the legislative process on some pretty significant things. If you look at the recommendations that came out of the task force and look at what was actually in session, we just about ran the table this year uh, on successful legislation. So it was a huge, uh, huge achievement for the, the roadmap task force. Uh, a lot of thanks to Clay White for uh, facilitating that process and uh, getting us to a point where we had fairly broad agreement and were able to get uh, a number of really important bills over the line. So the first one I wanna talk about is 1293. This was not a roadmap bill, but it was a bill that talked a lot about, this kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of the changes on housing and a lot of the conversations around predictability. And it was really about um, looking to replace a more discretionary design review process with more objective standards that can be administrated, that that can be that can be reviewed administratively without having to go through a discretionary design review process. So it requires clear and objective regulations, and um, it basically requires less discretion and more predictability in design review. Um, there were also some fairly significant changes to the Local Project Review Act, Senate Bill 5290 made a number of changes. This was one of the things that came out of the collaborative roadmap process. The cities and the counties and the builders were able to agree on some changes to the permit timelines bill, to the permit timelines requirements in, in state statute, the Local Project Review Act. So some of the changes is, first of all, it exempts most minor interior alterations from the site plan review process. So if it's going on inside the building and there's not a change in use, then it does not require you to go through site plan review. I actually, I'm so, I would be surprised if a lot of jurisdictions were sending tenant improvements through site plan review now, but um, that was one change. Uh, there was a change in the process for determinations of completeness, uh, changes to the project review timelines, including kind of a statutory schedule table, um, some requirements that if you've got these timelines and your timelines aren't met, the consequences, local governments have a duty to refund some of the permit fees. There's also a requirement for larger metro cities and counties to send their permit timeline performance reports to commerce. Right now, if you're in a big metro area and you're in a city over 25,000, you have a responsibility to do a permit timelines performance report and post that on your website. That's current law, it's been in place since the passage of the Local Project Review Act. That was changed this year. So now the requirement is that you have to send that report to commerce 
and Commerce has a duty to compile those reports and produce a consolidated report showing how the whole state's doing on that. So we will be, we have to, we have to stand that system up and um, put together the, the format you're going to use for submitting that information to us. And then we have to collect it all and put it on the website. Um, there was also some, some amendments to the application procedures process. Um, we have uh, some stuff on our to-do list as a result of 5290 as well. First of all, we've got a grant program that we have to develop where cities, grants to cities for modernizing their permanent process. We've got a $3 million appropriation for those grants. That was only a 2024 appropriation. So this is work that's got to get done by June 30 of next year if you're going to be applying for a grant. Um, there's also, we have the duty I already alluded to on compiling timelines reports. We have, a, we have to establish a task force to examine the feasibility of statewide electronic permit software. So we've established, we're, we're gonna be in the process of establishing that task force. Um, while we have the task force together, we will, be need to, we will need to do guidance on the changes to the Local Project Review Act. So we were gonna be, um, as long as we got these folks coming together, we're gonna use them as a sounding board for any guidance we do on local project review as well. So uh, if, you, if this, is, uh, this is a high view of yours, uh, let me know, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're gonna, we also have a duty to produce an estimate of what it would cost for the state to offer on-call permit assistance staff. So we have to do a cost estimate. That is due December, 2023. So we gotta jump right on that. Um, we also uh, have, uh, there's also, um, I'll go on to the next one later. That's, that's probably on a different slide. So that's what's going on in the Local Project Review Act. Some other changes from the session. Um, there's a kind of a cleanup bill on the Shoreline Master Program update schedule. This doesn't affect your current schedule, but will it affect the next one? You may remember a couple years ago, the legislature passed a bill that moved your periodic update schedule from a ten from a seven year interval to a ten year interval. So this bill, what it does is it changes the next shoreline master program update schedule. So it puts the so the shoreline master program is also on a ten year interval and remains synchronized with the GMA update schedule. There is a bill that allows cities to adopt the your CAO by ref to adopt the county CAO by reference. So if you're a city and you're under 25,000 people, rather than maintaining your own critical areas ordinance and rather than updating your own critical areas ordinance, you have the option of adopting the county CAO as amended by reference. And once you've done that, you no longer have a duty to maintain and you no longer have a duty to periodically review your CAO. Your CAO is then just the county CAO. Um, this is particularly important for counties, for cities that are in partially planning jurisdictions, because the critical areas ordinance update is the only periodic update they have to do. So if they adopt the county one by reference, they have no more periodic update responsibilities. The county ordinance has to be in compliance at the time you adopt it. Um, this is voluntary, so cities are not required to do that, and you have to adopt it as amended. Uh, the other thing to know is the bill uh, dictates that if the money that we would have allocated for the critical areas ordinance update portion, if we were going to give you a grant, the portion of that that would go to your critical areas ordinance that goes to the county instead of the city. So you'll be walking away from some of your periodic update formula money. I haven't figured out exactly how much of that. We're thinking it's probably around 25000 based on the formula, what the formula would operate for those partially planning cities. So there's an option to adopt uh, the county CAO by reference. The other one was for very small cities, cities below 500, you have the option of adopting a more streamlined, um, limited periodic review process, really boils down to just the update of your capital facilities plans. So very streamlined update process for small cities below 500. So moving forward, what, what do we have in store to help you with implementing all the new work coming out of session? So on the climate element, we've mentioned the greenhouse gas reduction requirements, the climate resilience element requirements and environmental justice. 
if you there was not an environmental justice bill this year as a standalone bill, but if you read through 1181, you will find a lot of the principles of environmental justice that you would put in an environmental justice bill got full, folded into 1181. So there are changes to public participation. Um, we are we will be providing grants to community-based nonprofits to enhance their ability to participate in the local planning process. There are a number of changes to the open space requirements and the land use element requirements, all related to addressing environmental justice. So there were pretty significant changes related to environmental justice. We will be, uh, I mentioned some of the things we're gonna be working on there. Uh, we've got a cl model climate resilience sub element. We've done a few pilot projects with some jurisdictions. That's on the street now. Um, Y'all can have a look at that and start work on that. Um, we will be making some modifications to that. Uh, we have to do that by December of this year. I would call that calibration rather than rewrite. But you know, when we started this process, it was we didn't have a final bill. So it's really just a matter of going back through the final bill and making sure that what we have in the guidance is actually consistent with with everything that was in the bill as it was finally as it finally passed the legislature and is finally into session law. And on greenhouse gas reduction, we have our preliminary, we have our list of greenhouse gas reduction measures. You know, if you're a jurisdiction that has to update and adopt and implement measures to reduce greenhouse gas reduction, Commerce has a duty under the bill to provide a list of measures you can choose from. We have, uh, we've been working on that list for the last couple of years. And we've got that list. Uh, we've got that list available right now. Again, we're going to be going back and looking back at some calibration just to make sure that we've covered everything that the final version of the statute requires us to cover. But you can certainly have a look at that right now and get started uh, using that. Um, something that's new for us under the climate bill is there's a voluntary approval process. So there was a lot of concern about the potential for appeals on such a new and sweeping. Uh, update to the GMA. So one of the things that the legislature did was it granted local governments the authority to seek approval from commerce. So this would be uh, a situation, this would be uh, a case where you're concerned about an appeal, you can come to commerce. If we certify your climate change element, then any subsequent appeal of that element is an appeal of our approval and commerce and the local governments will be partners in that appeal process. So it's it, in, in statute, it looks a little, it looks quite a bit different from the shoreline approval process. I think they actually work pretty similar in practice. The big difference is because this is voluntary, if you intend to seek approval, you need to notify us of your intent to seek approval early in the process. Because the shoreline master program approval is mandatory, Everyone knows they're gonna be going through that. Ecology knows they're gonna be going through that process because this one is manned as voluntary. Uh, local governments that wanna take this route need to notify commerce that this is the route you wanna take so that we're aware as we're moving through the process that this is something that will ultimately come through appeal for appeal. There is also a, a portion of the process for a joint hearing. So under the process that we've established, that's established in the statute, when it comes through to review for us, this is gonna be a closed record review. We're not holding a separate hearing. The hearing that we hold on our decision is going to be the hearing that you hold on your adoption. So there's no second bite at the apple. This is to make sure that we encourage any participant who may be contemplating an appeal are making sure that they're getting all of the issues in front of the local government and that they're brought and bringing up new issues in front of commerce that a local government hasn't had an opportunity to consider. So those are some of the significant features of the appeal process, the way or the this approval process that would be different from what you find, might find in a shoreline uh, process, but this is gonna be a fairly, this is gonna be a new thing for us. Um, on housing, we've already talked about the new housing bills. We've been working for the past two years on guidance to help local governments with the implementation of mental housing requirements. So we've got a lot, we've got a docu we've got document libraries, we've got examples, 
We've got a toolkit of potential standards you can use. We've got pro forma tools to help you see the financial viability of different middle housing types, photo library, presentations. We've got a ton of videos out there. So there's a lot of material that you can use. We've also been providing grants to local governments to start moving this way voluntarily. And a lot of, a lot of local governments have taken this up on it. So we've already got some, some lessons learned uh, in moving through this process. So if you're, if you're coming into this fairly new, We've got a lot out there. We will be developing a model ordinance. We have an obligation to produce a model ordinance. And the, the significance of that model ordinance is that if you do not adopt regulations to implement 1110 by the deadline, which is six months after your periodic update deadline, then that model ordinance is what applies until you go about implementing it yourself. So it's kind of a self-implementing thing if you haven't gone, gone and done your own. So that means we need to get that model ordinance up and running uh, fairly quickly as well. So we're going to be working on that model ordinance. We also have a number of places where we have to make uh, sort of a certification decision, and we'll be trying to start up the process for that. Local governments who are seeking to provide exceptions to their parking requirements, local governments who are looking for an extension of the timeline for implementation for areas that are lacking infrastructure, in those two cases, local governments need to come to us and we need to certify, uh, we need to do an independent verification of those. So we're gonna need to start the process of how we go about considering those verifications. And we need to adopt, we need to adopt a rule on that. So we'll be doing rulemaking on that as well. Um, and there's one last thing that we need to look at is local governments have the option. If you've already done something and you think it's very, very close to what the middle housing bill would require, you have the ability to come to Commerce and Commerce can certify that what you've done is what the statute uses the term substantially similar. So if you've already been through it and it was a tough process and you're just really concerned about having to take your council back through that process all over again, you can come to Commerce and we can look at it and we can say, yeah, this is this basically gets you where you needed to get anyway with only some relatively minor changes. Uh, but we have, to, we have to look at that and we need to certify that. So. Um, that's going to be a new role for us, um, and um, we'll be uh, we'll be in touch with how that works. And um, I don't know if I have a lot of answers to the questions of how that works, but I think more importantly would be um, we're starting with a blank sheet of paper. So if you've got strong opinions about how that ought to work, we want to hear from you because we want to make sure we get it right and we want to make sure it's practical. So more stuff about implementing the housing bills. We've got ADU guidance out in there. We've had to get ADU guidance for a long time. We've recently updated that. We were in the middle of updating that uh, along with MRSC. Uh, thanks to Steve and Lisa for your work on helping us with guidance, but they've we were working on this for a while before the bill passed. So when the bill passed, we were able to go back through, do a fairly quick uh, recalibration to match the new requirements. And we've already got our housing We've already got our ADU uh, housing guidance out there. Um, model ordinance I already talked about. We're in the process. We just kicked off a major rulemaking effort. This is going to include everything we need to do uh, related to 1110, but it's also going to include our update to our housing element rule. So these are the rules we need to update to implement 1220. We did a housekeeping rulemaking update a while ago, but it was in the, we were kind of in the middle of that process when 1220 passed. So we, we knew that was going to need more time and more effort, and we wanted to make sure the, uh, everything else got done. So now we're sweeping back, we're circling back, we're going to be addressing the housing bills. We're also going to be picking up new uh, updates to the rule, the Lammert rule and the urban growth area rule to address the changes that were made last year to those portions of the GMA. So lots, of, uh, lots more. Uh, Lots more to talk about on, on those fronts as well. So this is the implementation timeline. Uh, you heard about that a little bit from Paul and Liz already. The main thing to note is the timeline for 1181 and 1110. So if you're in the Puget Sound for the climate element, you're due in 2029, but the first group up for implementing the climate requirements are gonna be the jurisdictions due in 2025. So Whatcom County, Thurston County, Clark County, Lewis County, y'all are the first ones up on the climate element. There are some provisions in there on the resilience element 
to allow you to adjust the deadline if you're going to sync up the resilience element update and your update of your FEMA hazard mitigation plan. There, those changes were made to allow jurisdictions to use the FEMA hazard mitigation planning process and the FEMA hazard mitigation grants to develop a joint hazard mitigation plan and climate resiliency sub-element. If that's an option you wanna take, that's gonna, you have the authority to move your implementation timeline out to, uh, to allow you to make that change. So if that's what you're contemplating doing, let us know so, so we're aware of what your, what your deadline would be. So that's the, that's the important stuff on the implementation of the climate element. The housing element is due six months after the update of your periodic update. So your periodic update, that's due, and then six months later, your the implementation of the middle housing rules, the development regulations associated with that are gonna be due, are gonna be due six months after. So those are the changes to the implementation timeline associated with these bills. Um, grant funding. The legislature has provided a tremendous amount of grant funding. We've got the $10 million base that's funding our periodic update grants. We've also got funding for um, climate action. We've got $40 million to implement climate action. That's not $40 million per biennium. My understanding is that's coming $40 million transfer out of the Climate Commitment Act account. And we will be, that's my understanding right now from the budget writers is that's what we got for the whole implementation cycle. Um, we've also got funding for middle housing that includes the last year of the increase in document recording fee that goes into the planning and environmental review fund. That is actually right. This is the last year of the document recording fee. That was the money that came to implement 1923 the money we were using for voluntary housing action plans, happy grants, all that kind of stuff. We're using the last year of that funding to cover portions of the housing element update. So that's already baked into your, that last year of, re, of uh, document recording fee, that's already baked into the uh, periodic update formula. But we've got additional money for implementation of middle housing, We've got, we've also got funding for jurisdictions who want to voluntarily address salmon recovery in their planning and development regulations. So there's, it's not a requirement, but it's funding that we're providing, to, that we can provide to local governments. We've got two and a half million dollars a year, and that's going for either, it's going for a combination of things we can use it for. One would be jurisdictions that want to implement the Puget Sound Regional Council's watershed characterization work into their comprehensive planning process. Another potential use would be jurisdictions seeking to implement monitoring and adaptive management of their critical areas ordinance. And a third one would be for jurisdictions seeking to uh, enhance their ability to protect critical areas from unregulated or unpermitted activity. So if you've got code enforcement that you'd want to do around illegal impacts to critical areas, um, this would be funding to allow jurisdictions to expand those programs. Um, so this is what we this is what you're seeing here on the slide is a snapshot of what our current long-term outlook looks like for grant funding. This is you can see this goes out to 2031, based on what's both in the current budget and what's in the the forecast outlook. This is what grant the, the grant funding profile looks like. This may change over time. Uh, what we've seen since we first started running these calculations is the legislature, as it passes new requirements, as long as the budget's looking good for them, they tend to be adding more things. So it looks like it tapers off, but we might get some of this coming back uh, in future years. But there's a lot of opportunity right out, out there right now. So if you've got something you're interested in doing uh, and you're not sure if there's grant funding for it, uh, come talk to us, call your planner. Uh, see what we can work out. The the update grant letters should be you should be getting those sometime in the next week or two, talking about how you go about applying for those grants, uh, how much money you have available. Um, this is the uh, this is the short version. This is the lookup table. So uh, you can look to see what your population is, and you can see where the population ranges are, and this is what your grant's going to be. So if you're a 
a GMA city and you uh, have a population of 9,000 ish, uh, you're going to get 125 grand. So you can already start thinking about, okay, how would I, how would I plan for that? But that's going to be over a two year period. So if you're a central Puget Sound jurisdiction, you're going to be getting your second allocation uh, this year. If you're a uh, if, if you're a 2025 jurisdiction, you're going to be getting your first year allocation. And this, again, this is the formula funding for the periodic update. This is the floor. Additional funding will be available for climate and middle housing. Uh, all that's still coming. That's going to be on top of this. We don't, we don't know what those, we don't, we don't have a lot of, we don't have our control numbers yet from OFM. So we can't, we don't have uh, total grant amounts or individual jurisdiction amounts for those yet, but um, we'll be getting those to you as soon as we can. So that's what I've got. We got a lot of work to do. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, really looking forward to working with you all. And I want to thank you for um, for the, the good input you've provided us. And um, as we go through the implementation process, uh, we'll have a lot of we'll have a lot of decisions to make, and we want to make you part of that. So uh, we really do want to hear from you. Thanks so much, Dave. A great presentation, lots of information. I, I want to just say thank you for being there and uh, tracking so much of this stuff. Um, I think as maybe people saw, like I've been tracking a piece of it, Liz, Robin, you know, different people have been tracking different pieces, but I, I think you've got a good handle on all these different pieces that touch GMA. So really appreciate that. I'm going to uh, launch into some of the questions that we've received both before the session started, and we've been collecting some through the Q&A, trying to organize them by topic, and we'll maybe go a little bit in reverse order. So Dave, you ended with kind of the funding and the guidance stuff coming out of commerce. Mm -hmm. um, I think you pretty well covered it. Um, so I'll just reiterate a question, but like, when can we expect the grant funding to be available? You said letters on the general uh, grant uh, for comp plans, in the next couple of weeks or so that yeah that's coming up right away that's a really good question paul the short answer to that is july 1 so even if you don't have your letter on july 1 even if you don't have a contract signed on july 1 these are cost reimbursement contracts so any work that is performed after july 1 is eligible for reimbursement even if you haven't signed the contract so your average contract nothing, they won't pay for anything before the date of execution. These are interagency agreements on formula grants. So we're not bound by that requirement. So, you know, you start bill us for anything you've done after July 1. Um, when you're thinking about don't wait around to start spending your money, you know how much you have, um, put it in your budget and your scope and um, um, we'll work it out. And uh, I assume the Key advice is reach out to their liaison. The yeah, the talk county to your state. planner. Yeah. Um, you know, and in terms of tracking everything, just full disclosure, I have no idea what's going on. I got a small army of people now who know what's going on. But. <laughs> Dave, a little bit of a, a specific question about that. So a couple of years ago, Commerce had a, a funding for the housing assistant programs and Happy. Mm -hmm. Are those continuing? Do those go away and are they being replaced by like the middle housing grants or do you know how that works? There, the, that was funded by a $2.50 increase in the document recording fee. And that $2.50 increase in the document recording fee under statute, this is uh, the statute called 1923 from a few years ago, that went into the Planning and Environmental Review Fund until 2024. 2024 is the last year of that. After that, the funding goes into what's called the Home Security Fund, which is where they fund like a lot of the state assistance for homeless shelters and things like that. So um, we're using the last year of that to fund, to partially fund the housing element updates. So basically your periodic update grant is bigger than, when, than it would otherwise be because we're using that last year. If you look back at the slide, you'll see it's $10 million, $10 million. And then in 2024, there's a little dip up. That's two and a half, that's two and a half million dollars. We're, we're actually spending $12.5 million on the periodic update formula this year instead of $10 million. And that two and a half million is coming from the last year of that uh, document recording fee allocation. So that's where that money went. There's new funding for the middle housing 
but um, that's a separate appropriation. But that money is uh, that money is now the 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 old money we used to use for happy grants and stuff. That's all gone. Well, there there's a lot of funding sources for grants for different topics. Um, fully uh, sympathetic to all of our agencies as to whether you can kind of like find the staffing and consultants and and all that to to make yeah. all the work happen. Um, let's. Uh, before we go to uh, the 1181, there were a couple, I, I think, Dave, you were talking about one of the bills talking about uh, thresholds for tenant improvements. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think maybe we should have started out with kind of like, none of this has been gone to a hearings board or anything. We're just reading the bills and trying to understand them as yeah. best we can. But there is a question about, you know, if uh, TIs, uh, tenant improvements and their exemption levels um and how to review some of those uh on-site impacts if they are exempt could you, i don't know if you're prepared but if possible can you expand a little bit about that exemptions for tenant improvements um that, that, this may might be two in the weeds but and if it is that's okay I, I just thought i'd check i'm i'm reluctant to answer the question without the bill in front of me <laughs> right. That, and I think but, that might be an answer for some of these of like, well, yeah, we need to kind of look at the language of the bill and and, and look through that further. Yeah. Um, so, so let's let's move on. Um, this one, I, I think we might have a have an answer for it. It might fall into that category a little bit. But Dave and Liz, I think maybe both of you can answer 1181. It's general requirement for the Puget Sound counties is delayed till 2029 with that mid cycle review of the comp plan for the element. Um, but it has a number of parts that relate to land use element, the capital facilities element, recreation element. Does the whole batch, um, the, the whole batch of requirements fall under that 20, 2029 deadline for the Puget Sound counties? Um, or is it just the um climate change element Liz, you want to start? i'll start i guess i'd be curious about, about dave's take um so if you want to look at the bill it's section 15 that talks about deadlines and kind of like where the deadline language comes up uh the where the language they talk about with 2029 is really it focuses on the, the on climate the climate element and the transportation element so it, it's really just specifically calls out those two um it, it's too late. It would be too late to incorporate changes for the 2024 updates. It's in terms of like you can't. The, the, the legislature was too late in terms of uh, you know two years out needing to provide uh, a guidance to uh, make changes to the 24 updates. So I'm a little bit. I mean, maybe I'm curious about Dave's take um, on things. Hmm. Yeah, there it is. So I took the I took the liberty of sharing my screen so we could actually look at the statute. Yep. So. Cities uh, they're required under Section Four to include climate change and resiliency element, and then this is the and this is the uh, subsection five. That's the part about the mandatory elements. So this is specific to the transportation element and climate change and resiliency elements. So generally speaking, if the if the if the bill specifies it's limited to one thing. It applies to that and it doesn't apply to other and current law applies. So I would suggest the so um, my first read of that would be that the changes to the land use element, uh, any changes you need to do to implement requirements related to other portions like open space, um, changes related to environmental justice, that those are due, those are due this year. Um. It's somewhat related, so, and this this might generate kind of a speculation, but 1181 included the word enhance in the GMA goals. Um, in the years past, there's been work on having like a, a net improvement to ecological value. Do you see, again, this is kind of a speculative question here, but do you see that word enhance as getting at that net improvement? Yeah, you've got it right there, Dave. Um, or, or, or maybe just like yeah. can you give us remember, a remember, this change? is a goal and not a requirement. Right. Okay. So, 
I would retain open space and green space, enhance recreational, enhance fish and wildlife habitat. So that says that taken together, one of the goals of your planning program overall should be to enhance fish and wildlife habitat. That is different from your duty. You have a, it is a requirement. You have a duty to protect critical areas, which is your duty to ensure no net loss of function and value through your critical areas ordinance, using your police power, your regulatory authority, okay? The enhanced piece of that, I would say would probably come from non-regulatory programs. So that would say that when you're balancing and when you're looking at all your goals, one of the goals of your planning program, one of the requirements is gonna to be to ensure no net loss. But one of your overall goals should be through a combination of different non-regulatory tools to look for ways to enhance fish and wildlife habitat, which I mean, it could be how you do low impact stormwater, could be related to uh, um, different habitat restoration programs you've been participating in. A lot of jurisdictions have open space tax credits, those kind of things. There's a lot of things you can do on the non-regulatory side. Um, I would say that goal says that um, this this says that you should be looking at ways to use your non-regulatory authority to uh, seek out and implement opportunities to enhance fish and wildlife habitat. Yeah, so, so I, that, I wouldn't I say this is a net eco this is not net a net ecological gain regulatory standard. This is right. a planning goal. Right. So in a comprehensive plans, it would make sense for local jurisdictions to look at enhancing going beyond just the regulatory environment. But this is since this is the goal, as you just said, it's not changing the regulatory framework. Yeah, yeah. This is not this is they did not change the critical area. They did not change the duty to protect critical areas. They did not change the regulatory standard. Dave, here's one. And I don't know. I don't know how any of us will answer this, but maybe you have an idea um, on critical areas regulation. So outside of 1181, but um, in, in the bill that allows a city to adopt, um, and I'm trying to think of like, okay, well, that's a certain set of cities. But the question is, well, what if that city um, overlaps a county boundary? Um, like, is there, do you, are you aware of like, this might be one where we'd have to go back and kind of read how it looks, how the exact wording of the bill as well. Um, yeah. Do you have any immediate reaction to if a city falls into that category where they could adopt the county's critical areas regulations, but they happen to split between two counties? I'd say pick one. <laughs> it seems like a, a good first step. And then, um, yeah, maybe maybe if you're one of the few cities that would fall into that category, to yeah, I can think go, of go back two, and read that language. Yeah, I, Woodland and I think Elmer City, Straddles, Douglas, and Okanagan County. Great. Or Grant and Douglas, I can't remember. There's like a there's just a handful. Yeah. Bothell's over the twenty five thousand threshold, so it wouldn't apply. Right. Some of the ones I was thinking wouldn't actually Pacific, happen. Pacific, maybe. Pacific probably would. Let's uh let's move to some of the housing questions. Um, there are a couple of questions that came up about covenants. Um, and I can try to answer this a little bit and then might might need some help. But so one, there is a question which I think is great. I don't know that any of us can directly answer this, but is there a way to identify neighborhoods with covenants? Um, or homeowners associates that might have some sort of restriction. Um, and um, somebody asked, related to that, um, somebody asked like properties that are, or areas that are exempt from the 1110 that might have covenants. And I just, I will wanna clarify that. So in the 75% rule, the areas that the bill identifies are, it doesn't say areas with covenants. So that's in some ways a separate issue. It identifies areas, uh, risk of displacement, a lack of infrastructure, critical areas, areas within a radius of a commercial airport of at least 9 million annual employments. I think that means SeaTac, um, as well as sea level rise, flooding, geological hazards, and, and a few other details there. So those are the ones 
those are the types of reasons that areas could be excluded under that 75% rule. When I was talking about covenants or homeowners association, I was really just meaning to imply like there's both where the, the law might apply to the entire single family zone, but the city should also have a realistic assessment as to if, if the city is trying to calculate, does that change your capacity or what's the potential for housing in your community to recognize that covenants, homeowners associations, other there might or there might be other barriers that really limit uh, how it might actually be implemented over time. Dave, you have anything you would want to add to that? Yeah. Um, so I guess I guess the thing I would add would be every you know it's axiomatic that when a city approves a development permit, which is the bill is talking about what you would approve or not approve under your regulatory authority. The approval of the city is not all the approval you may need from anyone to do what you want to do. Okay, you still got to get a loan. Some might have a lien on it. Private contracts govern what people can do too. Covenants are private contracts. Um, local governments are not responsible for enforcing um, covenants. That's between the homeowner and the homeowners association to figure out whether that's something they can do or not. In terms of how do you know, I'm not sure. I don't know how you'd go about determining what covenants encumber what without actually going in and reading every homeowners association document in your city um, to determine that. I mean, I think you're right. That's going to affect the ultimate, the ultimate amount of housing production at build out, the number of people who will be able to exercise all of the options that are now available to them to construct middle housing on their property is going to be affected by um, whether their homeowners association is going to allow them to do it. But um, that's uh, it's not something the local government's uh, obligated to enforce. Yeah. Um, another question was about just the, the math and the calculation of units. Um, so the ADU bill requires two additional ADU units in addition to the primary. Uh, middle housing bill requires either two or four or six. Um, does that mean, say, uh, if a city is required to allow for duplexes, then does each duplex need to also allow for an ADU? My understanding is, re again, just like reading the bill, my understanding of it is that they're both separate and they overlap. So 1110 requires allowing a range of different types. It's, I think it's six out of nine of the types mm -hmm. of housing that um, could be middle housing. So if you just allow, you say if you allow the ADUs, two ADU units in addition to the primary unit, and you say like, hey, we allow three, you still have to allow for the type of unit um, allowed by the middle housing bill and some of the other provisions in there. So um, the, allowing for ADUs doesn't fully satisfy the middle housing bill even if the number three is bigger than the number two in the middle housing bill. The bill um, says cities may allow those uh, ADU units, but it also talks about that they may be counted as part of that unit count. So I think cities have some discretion there. Um, you, you can tell me if you read it differently, Dave, but that they have some discretion. They could count the ADUs as part of that unit count. Um, and they may say like, well, we allow duplexes and um, each duplex could have an ADU with it. Um, so I think cities have some flexibility there. Did I make that more confusing, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, it is a little bit uh, messy in that you have two bills and you have- Yeah, yeah it's a little bit, I mean, that would, I mean, clearly ADUs would count as one of the middle housing types yeah. of the six you need to allow. Um, no, I don't think you need to put an ADU on an ADU. Right. Um, one question, a good question, which I, I don't know that we can answer this one either, but about how to help people if they want to, a developer or landowner, if they want to create condominiums. Cities generally aren't in the business of figuring out whether homeownership or homes or owner or rental or what that property does. Um, but it, as the person noted, it feels a little unsatisfying to just say, well, talk to the talk to the county or the assessor 
about that process. Dave, do you have any guidance for if people want to encourage condominiumization, like how to provide resources? Maybe there's some, the there's some particular, yeah, there's some particular uh, versions of the bill when they talk about townhomes that, that that would include unit lot subdivisions, which basically means you actually subdivide the land underneath a townhome, because that apparently helps in um, in making that that's 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 a pretty popular thing. I think it's fairly commonly allowed. Um, I would say. I mean, one of the pieces of making the middle housing bill work as an overall policy is beyond what local governments allow, there's the whole housing supply chain that will over time throughout the West Coast begin adapting to these new opportunities. And um, that's going to tune how things are financed. Um, I know one of the things uh, some jurisdictions have done with their happy grant money is they've done pre approved. Uh, plans for ADUs. Um, we've we've seen, and I think South Bend, Indiana, has done pre-approved plans for small-scale neighborhood multifamily, fourplexes, triplexes, duplexes. They've got some pre-approved plans, and that's certainly the kind of thing that you could do that would make make it easier for a small uh, uh, someone who owns one lot and is not a developer by trade um, who wants to do this. We allow them to do that. Um, so those, I mean, these, there's a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of things local governments can do to try to make that, uh, um, make that more, make the opportunity that's offered by the bill more accessible. Um, uh, right, and both the opportunity for whether condominium or fee simple. Yeah. Um, that, like they may be able to facilitate fee simple land ownership as opposed to just a condominium. So I, I think it's worthy to look yeah. into that. And mm -hmm. it might be a good task list for, for us in our kind of our housing resources to, to keep working on. Um, the, uh, there's a question, size of jurisdictions for House Bill 1337. So Dave, as I understand, it's the urban area of both the county and incorporated cities. So that they, uh, unlike the other bills that have these di different size thresholds, the ADU bill applies to all the cities and the yeah. urban area of the counties. Yep. Um, oh, the, I don't know if we can uh, get into the weeds this much, but does 1110 allow for, um, is it regardless of the size of the lot, uh, does the existing lot, need to be conforming or non-conforming um there is that threshold of i think it's a thousand square feet in the mm -hmm. bill am i remembering right dave do you know yeah i think so yeah so i think it it looks for anything over a thousand square feet so i think even if the and i i'm just going from how i've read it <laughs> again that that big make culpa here but mm -hmm. the um our caveat that if a lot is simply non-conforming, say like you have a half acre zoning minimum um, and the lots, you know, say a third of an acre, my understanding is the bill would still apply to that type of lot, even though it might be non-conforming under your zoning code. Uh, but again, just my my read of it. Um, let me- Yeah, it says, it says per lot, it doesn't say anything about conforming or non-conforming. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what your underlying requirements are for the build to build for uh, what's a non whether non conforming lots are buildable. Yeah, and then I'll get one quick question in here and then turn it back to Liz and that's just, you know, if somebody only wants to build one ADU or one unit, there's no prohibition against them doing that. So when we we're talking about two ADUs or you have to do a duplex or a fourplex. As you were saying, Dave, like there's one thing about what the city's zoning needs to allow, but there's also what the property owner, the financing, the contractor, the architect, the, there's all there's still plenty of opportunity there. So if somebody just wants to build one ADU unit, the, there's no prohibition. There's nothing that requires them to build more. No. Um, all right. Liz, you put in a good note about CM credits. And how about if I hand it back to you, Liz, to wrap us up? Yeah, really appreciate it. So I've got one final slide to share here. 
Um, Great. Well, we've really appreciated everyone's attendance today. Obviously, some of this uh, bill stuff is still a work in progress, and we'll kind of understand it a little bit more, I think, as the as time goes on. But we really appreciate all of your questions here today. We tried to get to as many as we can, could. Uh, if you've got additional questions, but particularly about comprehensive plan updates, um, please feel free to reach out to us at planreview at psrc.org. Um, and I think we've got one final poll question. Um, Heather, if you could launch the poll. Thank you. So just kind of a reassessment question of kind of how are you feeling at the end of the workshop? Um, and if you have any other feedback for us, we would um, gladly accept it. We will continue to do a couple more of these events and welcome some feedback. Um, so we'll leave that up for a moment to let people respond. Um, if you are seeking um, AICP uh, credits, um, I include the, the number on the screen, but I also uh, tried to provide a link is in the chat box um, if that's, uh, so that you can find that more easily. So uh, we really appreciate um, everyone's time. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we will have, there's a, a, a little uh, survey that question that launches after the webinar closes. So uh, we would really appreciate if you could um, fill that out for us um, as, as the event closes. So give us a minute more, I think. Um, thank you all for joining us today.